So our first panel, as you see, is going to be looking at the media and uh, exploring a civic institution that in many ways helps to frame what is reality, what is truth, uh, to go back to the great foundation laid by Professor George. Uh, we have a great panel here, uh, and I am going to welcome up our moderator for this panel, uh, Tunku Vardarajan. Uh, you see his uh, background here at the Wall Street Journal, also at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm also delighted to note that he teaches with us here at the Graduate Policy School as well. And so without any further ado, please welcome up Tunku. Thanks, Dean Peterson, for that introduction. And uh, this feels like uh, the semester started again. Um, looks like uh, one of my lectures. And it's, for a change, it's nice, nice to, to see people listening in person. Two years of Zoom have killed my ardor. Um, uh, this is going to be a fun panel. I was told um, uh, before coming here that, that, that we, we should have as little preparation as possible, that this was going to be a conversational exercise. Uh, so I, that's what I told the three of them, and that's what I told myself. So we're sticking to that, sticking to that plan. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the panelists, I'll, and I'll, I'll be very brief. Connor Friedersdorf, to my left, uh, is a journalist, a staff writer with The Atlantic, and compiles uh, something called the Best of Journalism List, which I subscribed to this morning. Uh, you have $34 from my... Amex card winging, winging their way to you. Um, to his left, left is, is my very old friend Naomi Schaefer Riley. I knew her when she was just plain old Naomi Schaefer. Um, she's the author of, I counted this morning, six books, which is six more than I've written. Um, most of them have been on faith and education, including one which is particularly appropriate for Pepperdine called God on the Quad, which is your first book, I think, Naomi. Um, and she writes for many publications, including my own, the Wall Street Journal. And uh, th at the very end is Bhatia Ungar Sargon. Did I say it right? You've got the second most unpronounceable name in this, on this panel. Um, she's a former editor at The Forward and is currently opinions editor at Newsweek. Um, and is the only one on this panel who's written a book on the subject about which we're going to be talking today called Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. So I'm going to start with you, Bhatia. How is woke media undermining democracy? <laughs> so first of all, thank you all so much for coming and for having me. Thank you for inviting this Marxist Jewess into your sanctum sanctorum. Uh, I'm humbled to be here in such a great company and, and truly honored. Um, I, I, uh, I broke the rules and prepared a few things I wanted to say. Um, so I'll say them really quickly. So we're talking about free speech here today. But I think it's really important to note that we're talking about free speech in a sort of soft way, not a sort of First Amendment legal way. And what I mean by that is the best way for me to illustrate this is my husband is from the Donbass, and his uh, father lives in Russia. And they were arguing about Ukraine the other day. And his father said to him, well, obviously, if you're a journalist in America and you tell the truth about what's happening there, you would go to jail. That's why there's such uniformity of views about Russia and Ukraine in America. And we were talking about it afterwards. And I was thinking to myself, it's unthinkable to this Russian <laughs> that the uniformity of views in America on this subject is the result of anything short of state power, right? Because to him, living in a non-democracy, essentially, that's the only explanation, right? It is unthinkable to a person who grew up in China during the Cultural Revolution that the struggle sessions happening in America today, there's no gun at the end of that. It is purely voluntary, right? There is no state power backing up the threats to free speech. So in that sense, I'm almost uncomfortable talking about free speech because these are not threats to our First Amendment. Like nobody's going to go to jail for angering the Twitter mob, 
okay? So I think it's really important to point that out. Now, at the same time, there is clearly a level, a level of censorship happening, but it is purely driven by popularity contests. Like, that, that is the lame truth. I mean, it's lame, but it's also very exciting, right? Because it's so much easier to fix something like that, right? We don't have a problem where the government is threatening our free speech. We have a problem where popularity contests among elites and algorithms are censoring and limiting the views that are allowed into the public discourse. I think it's very important to make that distinction. Um, now, Twitter is 100% censoring conservatives, and our media companies are 100% at the behest of operate, and their success is totally dependent on social media and on engagement. So from that point of view, our media is very much tied to a very censorious apparatus, and that is very problematic. Okay? It, it results in conservatives being censored and in liberal self-censoring, not allowing themselves to think or say things that they know are true because they don't want to be subjected to the Twitter mob. Um, but, but, but to me, and, and, and this is just the, the last point I'm, I'll make because I'm so curious what you all think about that. The censorship that's happening between America's elites pales in comparison to the complete and utter deplatforming of the entire working class and middle class from public life. Okay? Nobody asked anybody in the working class whether they wanted to send $50 billion to Ukraine. Right? There's been a total deplatforming of working class voices and middle class voices. Of course, the middle class is disappearing. But that censorship, which was just completely done by both sides, is the real threat, I think, to democracy, much more so than the, the elites squabbling amongst each other, saying, oh, you're too, you're too far right to work at the New York Times. Oh, you're, right? Like that, that's happening for sure. You know? It's gross. It's problematic. But the mass deplatforming of the working class is such a bigger threat to our democracy. And um, I think it's really important we talk about that as well. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I'd forgotten you were a Marxist. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll show myself out. Nice, nice <laughs> phrase, working class. I hadn't heard that in ages. Um, Connor, you want, do you, maybe you don't have to pick up the thread from there. But she said one or two things that you may want to just tie into. Uh, this isn't about the first amendment so much as being the, the curbing of speech in a soft way. Um, what, what do you make of that? You, you know, there are, um, there are a dozen different angles in which I am supportive of free speech and kind of constantly fearing for its demise. I think it's one of those values both in the uh, First Amendment sense and in the broader culture of free speech sense that, that Mill talked about so wonderfully and that, that Jonathan Rausch has talked about in his book. Um, more recently, these things need defending in every generation. Um, people often ask me, do you think free speech is in crisis right now? Or there are debates about this. And I basically think that it's a value that is always under attack and that always requires uh, a robust defense for the next generation. Um, with regard to the media specifically, um, there are two things that concern me most right now. One is that the press, um, for all of its ideological biases, it used to have sort of a slight bias in favor of free speech and, and, and defending a culture of free speech. And I think that it, it sort of abandoning that traditional role that it has taken in a kind of self-interested way um, in the same way that you, know, you used to be able to count on the ACLU to defend free speech in a way that no longer seems to be quite true. Um, I, I think that in both cases, it's a kind of capture of these institutions by people from a, a relatively narrow ideological band um, of the American political spectrum. And at, at the same time, I think the press as a whole, or I, I guess I should say the uh, what some people call the mainstream media, other people call the legacy press, um, there are these set of longstanding institutions with mass audiences that I think um, reflect a smaller and smaller percentage of what Americans think. And that's not a value judgment about whether their particular slice is correct or incorrect. Um, but I worry about deliberative democracy in a country where um, the people running the public square, for better or worse, are not representing the full range of opinions, even of the two major political parties. I, I think not even representing actually the breadth of the Democratic Party, to be honest. Um, I, I worry what that does to deliberative democracy. 
Uh, and I won't go on for too long except to say that, you know, I'm a bit heartened by the fact that um, you have institutions like Substack coming along and just allowing the market to be met in terms of the kind of thoughtful commentary people want to hear from lots of different perspectives. But I would say that um, you know, truth seeking, the ability to seek the truth is one um, good that, that free speech facilitates. Another is just understanding what one's fellow citizens believe in a democracy. And um, there are lots of opinions that I would like to see the best version of them aired, even though I think that they're wrong, partly because I want to know what my fellow citizens think. And we cannot engage meaningfully in conversation and lobbying one another and coming to compromise if we truly don't understand the other perspectives that are out there. And I think the press is failing at that right now. Um, Naomi, I, I want to throw a particular question at you. It is, it is my recollection that you were one of the first journalists to be canceled by a publication. Was it the Chronicle of Higher Education? Yes. Could you tell us a bit about what happened to you and maybe talk about whether this sort of thing is now more commonplace or whether it stopped happening? Sure. And, 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 and maybe tie it into Connor's uh, thoughts on perspectives, other perspectives particularly. Uh, well, I thought it would be an apt metaphor if I lost my voice before a free speech conference. <laughs> so go me. Um, sorry about this. But um, so about 10 years ago, I had kind of a side gig as a blogger for the Chronicle of Higher Education. And they came to me after I had written a book against tenure. Um, and they knew my politics kind of going into it. But you know, there were probably 12 bloggers that they had hired by that point, And I was going to be you know, maybe one of two conservatives who are going to do this. And so every week or so, I would submit a blog entry. Um, and one, one week, I submitted one that criticized the discipline of black studies. Um, it was based on a, a cover story in the Chronicle that had um, celebrated a, a few dissertations um, that I thought sounded pretty absurd. And I wrote my blog post sort of making fun of them. Um, and I got this very concerned call after it had been published uh, from an editor there saying, uh, there's been a lot of criticism. Uh, do you want to respond to the criticism? And I looked at the criticism and I said, no, I, I don't really have anything else to say. And he said, are you sure? I said, I'm pretty sure I have nothing else to say. They can have their say. It's fine. Um, and so a couple of days go by and the criticism kind of builds. And there's actually a petition on, I think, change.org to get me fired from this job. A lot of people started using words like, you know, uh, I, I feel like I've been hurt, or this, this blog post has been a form of violence against me. And this is kind of the first time I really kind of started to hear that kind of language about this. Um, a couple of days later, I got a phone call from someone, um, actually at my former employer at the Wall Street Journal, asking if I thought I was going to be fired. It was Paul Jagot called me, said, do you think you're going to be fired from the Chronicle of Higher Education? I said, that would be ridiculous. Why would they do that? They hired me as a conservative. They knew what I was going to say. And sure enough, a couple of days go by, and I get a call from the editor saying, uh, we, have, we have to let you go. There are 6,000 signatures on this petition now, and, uh, and, and we feel that you've just, you're just you beyond the pale. So that was the end of that. Um, but I have to say, like there were certain kinds of language that was used, the, the social pressure that had built up against this editor who you know, decided to publish this in the first place. Um, kind of started, you know, to, to for me. Then I started to notice this more and more happening as the years went on. I mean, I don't paint myself as any great victim. This was, you know, a side gig for me. I still had a salary. Um, you know, it was it turned into kind of a very funny thing where um, I ended up going on a on a show um, where I was I was I think eight months pregnant at the time, and I was asked about my racist views. Um, my black husband came out like it was sort of all this like it, was, it sort of turned into comedy at some point um, but but I have to say like you know it, it did make me think like what what is this what is the mission of this kind of publication and if you're the Chronicle of Higher Education I think you could argue you're kind of a trade publication for professors and you have to make the professors the administrators happy um, but what about other publications that were starting to cave to this like I don't think the New York Times ever thought of itself as a as a kind of trade publication that just had to make you know its particular set happy. They were 
saying that they were going to offer you the news. Um, and so I, I, I guess just to, to kind of tie this into what Bacha and Connor were saying, um, I think what's happened here is that um, the, the, the inability or the lack of desire to defend free speech has happened because now there's so many people who think there's so many more important things than free speech. Free, if you ask a journalist, they'll say, sure, I love free speech, but, but you know, the truth, as I see it, is more important, or saving democracy, as I see it, is more important, or defeating Trump is more important, or any of these kind of issues have just, um, they're, they're talked about now with a sense of urgency that free speech does not have. Free speech is just kind of this dusty idea, a kind of you know old institution, the old ACLU would have defended. Um, but now there are these more urgent kind of emergency problems that we need to be facing. And I think that's where free speech has lost out. Do we see, and this is a question for any one of the three of you, do we see this aversion on both the left and the right within the media? Or is it a particularly is it a left-wing thing more than a right-wing thing? Well, I can I can just anecdotally um, answer that in a way that might be relevant, and then curious to hear what you think. But um, so before I was at Newsweek, I was at a like a, a publication, a Jewish publication that had a very avowedly lefty orientation. Um, but when I took the job as opinion editor, I said I'm only going to take this job if I can run opinion from across the political spectrum, and they were like, great. So in the beginning, I was there from 2016 to 2020. In the beginning, when I would publish a left-wing um, op-ed, the right would come after me in this like most vicious way. And when I would publish a left-wing op-ed, um, the right would come after me in a totally vicious way. There was just like you know, it was completely equal on both sides. By the time I left there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, by the time I left, when I would publish a far left op-ed, the right would be saying, well, I hate this op-ed, but I could see why she thinks it's important to run things like this. And when I would run a right-wing op-ed, the left would be like, to the gulag, right? <laughs> like, it, it had totally shifted. They would become this like being, being open to various points of view had become a right-wing proposition. And I was very shocked by that. What do you guys think? <laughs> you know, I, early in my career, I wrote for a lot of right of center publications, worked briefly um, with the Claremont Institute when I was at the Claremont Colleges. I definitely saw a kind of aversion to ideological diversity um, in right-leaning institutions. And it's always a bit hard to parse out, you know, people can have ideological magazines. You can have the Nation International Review and they're avowedly trying to advance a certain cause or principle. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that so long as you have a diversity of institutions. Um, and, you know, donor pressure often comes into play in some of these institutions and how they're going to shape things and whether personnel is a good fit. Um, I suppose I would say there's that kind of pressure, and it's always existed, sometimes to excess, sometimes in ways I would defend. Um, there's a different kind of pressure, I think, that comes from a kind of administrative capture of institutions where um, there's no, you know, it's one thing for National Review or the nation to say, you can write for us, but you shall not endorse ending conservatism if you're a national reviewer. Like, it's, it's pretty clear what the lines are. Um, what if it's creating a feeling of unsafety in a colleague, right? Uh, there's this case at Vox where Matt Iglesias, one of the founders of Vox, signed this letter at Harper's Magazine. It was a letter in defense of free speech. And one of his uh, colleagues, read into this out of whole cloth, as far as I can tell, the idea that it was an anti-trans letter. I think the idea was that J.K. Rowling also signed this thing among you know 50 different signatures and wrote to the managers at Vox and said, it makes me uncomfortable and feel unsafe, actually, at work that my colleague signed this. Um, I don't really know how to think through um, the logic of that uh, so much as to say that these kinds of maneuvers are happening at, at lots of different institutions to different degrees, and it's a different kind of attack on speech. It's a little bit less clear what you can say, and so the chilling effect is a bit more. And it's actually also not just, here is what we stand for, you must be within these ideas, but it's changing the notion of the relationship between speech and harm. 
and we've seen this in academia. Um, we've seen it, I think we're seeing it more and more in the press too. The idea that there are certain things that are harmful and those things, those concepts are creeping farther and farther and farther so that people are averse to saying more and more things. I mean, let, let's think through this because you, you talk about harm. I guess um, a, a question to ask there is, I mean, what is it that's being harmed? Uh, when, when, you know, when they fear that harm will happen. Um, you know, it, it's my sense that um, the progressive left, at least, uh, fears the first, loathes the first, or has come to loathe the First Amendment almost as passionately, passionately as it loathes the Second. Um, and 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 I've you know I've like you have wondered why that's the case. You mentioned earlier also that the ACLU doesn't really like free speech all that much anymore. Uh, so what, what what has happened? Why, why, let's put the ACLU to one side. The media. Why why is the media? Um, why have we come to this pass where the media um, is disavowing not just traditional news values, but also the First Amendment? One of the things to sort of, I, I don't want to pretend that this idea of kind of speech being harmful, like physically, make you feel physically unsafe, just came out of nowhere. I mean, I think the left has long been a proponent of the idea that there's something called hate speech that should be prosecuted, that there are hate crimes that should be specially prosecuted. And I think, you know, as long as I have lived in the kind of right wing media sphere, which is more than 20 years now, the right has, I think, always resisted those ideas that, um, that, there, that, that these words are not doing the thing of harming you and that they're not, it's not the same as physical harm. And, and I think it's just that those ideas have evolved further and further such that even things that seem pretty inoffensive, like signing a letter that happens to also be signed by the author of Harry Potter, um, you know, that that, that is a, a, almost an evolution of these earlier understandings of hate speech. Which is, it, it isn't just harm where you and I feel kind of somehow menaced physically or emotionally, but it's the, it's the shutting down of speech because that speech challenges or, in quotes, harms an agenda. So that's what they're worried. You know, that we've got to stop it because it's not doing our cause, whether it be transgenderism, climate, climate fears, uh, racial set-asides, set whatever it may be. It, it, these things come under challenge and become harder to defend if there are articulate examples of opposition to them. There are two pieces of this I would highlight. Um, one is another thing obviously we've seen in academia, which is if you start from the premise that one of our institutional imperatives that we're going to add is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that's going to be kind of up here over everything else. Um, in the same way that academic freedom might be, or in the same way that telling the truth might be at a journalistic institution or, or, or reporting the news, it raises the question of what that entails. And you could, I think, construe that to entail things within journalistic institutions that are completely consistent with news gathering and with free speech. Uh, but you could also define things in ways where you, know, you might define inclusion so that none of your employees feels attacked in your own pages, let's say. Uh, and, and so all these kind of ill-defined concepts can creep and can be used for different agendas. Um, there's also, you know, physical harm is kind of the harm that everyone agrees with. And I think that the New York Times case of James Bennett being pushed out is pretty instructive, where you have uh, the op-ed page that runs uh, uh, an op-ed by a sitting senator saying maybe if these riots continue we need to send out the National Guard or something like that. And the pushback was that with that was not, uh, you know, employees were furious about this at the time. Some were, some wanted James Bennett gone because this ran under his tenure. Um, but the pushback wasn't how dare you run this thing that we ideologically disagree with. That might have been the motivation, but that wasn't how it was articulated. The way that it was articulated and, and with the kind of help of the union at the New York Times was frame this in terms of safety. You are threatening the safety of my black colleagues at the New York Times. And the idea was that they would be out there reporting in the streets and then the National Guard would come and harm them. So it was a deliberate attempt, on the surface at least, to connect this to physical harm. 
And the kind of haziness and creep in these concepts is often where um, you find free speech losing ground. Got it. Um, I, I, I'll just make two quick points. Um, the, fir for, the first is I think that the speech that they find dangerous is not hate speech. It's true speech. It's convincing speech that doesn't push the agenda. I mean, that's the real danger. And I can say this for myself. Like when I see anti-Semitic or anti-black racism online, I don't recoil in horror and feel that I need to protect myself from it. But when I first encountered Heather McDonald's work, I thought, you better not read this, girl, because if you get convinced by this, you're going to lose your job and you're going to lose all your friends. Because it's dangerous. Because it might be true. And I don't know if I can handle that true thing. And I think for a lot of people in the class that we're critiquing right now, that is the case. Um, I will say, how, you asked how this happened, why this happened, that they turn on the First Amendment. I mean, to me, what, you know, what I wrote about in my book, the best lines of which were quotes from Connor and quotes from Eli Steele, um, you know, was, was that this looks like it's a story about politics, but actually it's a story about class. It's a story about how journalists used to be working class, and so they lived very working class lives, which are not, you know, protected in this way. They don't believe in protecting each other from, you know, dirty jokes or dangerous jokes or things like that. They, 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 they stopped being working class. There was this status revolution among the class of journalists over the course of the 20th century, and now they're part of the elites. They go to these universities that we're going to spend the rest of the day critiquing, where they learn things like, you know, that speech is harm, silence is violence, all of these slogans that come out of a very particular academic genealogy that does very much confuse, you know, the physical with the verbal, that doesn't have a sense of the reality of what it means to exist in the world. I think Christopher Lash made all of these points like, you know, 40, 50 years ago, so I feel a little bit embarrassed, like just re recycling his points. But like at the end of the day, to me, that-, that we're, is, we're meant to recycle. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, th this is really a story about class, about what happens when, you know, the people in charge of telling the great American story, when they have been, that has been, you know, there's elite capture in that very important fourth estate, and it ends up protecting one side of the political sphere as, it, as a way of protecting its own economic interests. So you're, 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 you're saying, and maybe Naomi, you, you can pitch in here, that the demographics of American journalism have changed, and as a result, we're, we're seeing all this stuff play out? It's interesting, not demographic, because they're still overwhelmingly white. But the reason they're overwhelmingly white is not because they're racist, it's because they're rich, and America's rich are still overwhelmingly white. Okay, the cl the problem, class but, composition. Yeah, a cl yeah, class composition, mm -hmm. exactly, yeah. I think if you want to get a feel for this, like if you go read, you know, Pete Hamill's um, many drinking memoirs, um, you know, you'll, you'll get a sense. I mean, I don't think he finished high school, um, but he was one of the great journalists of the 20th century, and he obviously was reporting on a lot of people that he related to. Um, he wasn't entering a foreign environment. I mean, when I, um, you know, just to give you an example, like the, the first book I wrote about religious colleges and universities, all of my books have been reporting books. So I've been almost every state in the country, I'm reporting on people who are not encountered by the people that I live with on a regular basis. So one of the first schools I went to visit was Bob Jones University. And I had a conversation, I remember, with my aunt, this lovely, my lovely Jewish aunt, 75 years old, Manhattan, and she'd never been to South Carolina or I think anywhere in the South, probably. And she was worried for my safety that I would go to Bob Jones University. And I just said, what, what do you think is going to happen to me there? I don't understand. But, but that, it, it, it's it, the, the kind of, even, even views that we could legitimately say were bigoted, um, I still didn't see what the threat to me was going to be going there. And I think this is the same attitude that I hear when, when, when we talk about going to interview Trump voters. I don't know if John Shields is still here, but, but this whole idea that you're going to this, like almost a foreign country, and you're going to talk to these people and, and try to figure out what they want, but you're almost scared to go there because you might encounter uh, you know, these, these people, these racist people with guns, and that's the attitude you're going in with. Um, so I do think that class thing has, has, has happened to a large extent. But the other thing I would say, the other kind of thread here that I don't want to lose is about this whole idea of a safe work environment that has happened in media. Um, I, I think if you had to trace it, and I'm not a legal expert, I think a lot of this has sort of happened around sexual harassment law, this whole idea that an employer is responsible for creating this safe environment for people. And I think that 
there is a legitimate reason for having those rules, but I think they've also been sort of taken to a, a, a kind of crazy extent. I mean, the way that people are forced to watch these videos about now, you know, now what constitutes sexual harassment is using someone's incorrect pronouns. Um, so so the, the whole idea of, of how we are regulating the workplace environment, I think, has really influenced newsrooms in a way that we haven't fully acknowledged. Um, in my reporting, it is a generational shift that seems to me to be related to the rise of growing up online and social media, right? So you can go back and find the genesis of safe spaces and the idea of words that wound in the early 90s and the late 80s and, and the, the fight between uh, critical race theorists and kind of more classically liberal thinkers like Henry Louis Gates, who was you know, pushing back and saying, look, free speech was integral to the civil rights movement. You don't want to give something like this away. So there's always been this kind of push back and forth uh, on the left about how broadly do we defend free speech? What if speech is being used in ways that seem to empower demagogues who are fascists or whatever? Um, but, but then you have this younger generation coming up who have the experience I mean, just imagine coming up in junior high school and you go home every night and people are talking about you or referencing you online and tagging you and maybe um, bullying you on Twitter or everyone is talking about the thing that someone said in class. Something about this gave people a different relationship to the written word and to speech and to media. In fact, their formative experiences of media were not the New York Times, they were their peers. And something about this has um, you know, caused them to be more friendly to the idea, uh, you know, as a percentage of their generation, that speech can be harmful, that speech can do harm, that there need to be regulations, that there need to be moderators. Um, and the idea of a kind of million untrammeled free speech, I think that they have a notion that it has higher costs than people of my generation do. And of course, this cohort was schooled in, in high school and in colleges, in institutions where they were taught to be fearful of the word, to be fearful of ideas, trigger warnings. I mean, this, this whole sort of hyper-protected generation has now graduated into the journalistic workplace and it's brought some of its fears and paranoias with it, I would say, since even though I'm not on the panel. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that, um, I think Honor's exactly right. Like, the, they're, they're interaction with the media was so personal. Mm. Everything is, is you you sort of going back and forth with people who are writing these things about you and and you know kind of how deeply wounded you could be by these words probably did give them a different sense of of what it was like, uh, of what it's like to be the object of this kind of um, media criticism. Um, and and also just sort of the, the 24 hourness of it that you can't escape it. I mean that it's it is happening while you're you know you're trying to sleep at two o'clock in the morning people are talking about you um, has also given people a different sense of this and there's also no there's also no hierarchy it feels like um, I mean maybe they're looking at the number of Twitter followers but maybe they're not and and so so the things that the New York Times is saying um, seem to like there's no distinction between that and what somebody with 15 Twitter followers is saying about you, that it's still this wound that you, you have to somehow protect yourself from. I mean, is, is, maybe we can start with you, but is Twitter bad for journalists? It didn't have to be, but places like the New York Times very consciously put into practice an obeisance to the Twitter mob very consciously that is very bad for America. So I'll give you an example. In 2014, the New York Times had an innovation report that was leaked. And it wasn't written by some you know, schmo in some side office. It was written by A.G. Salzberger, who was then the son of the publisher and is now the publisher. And in this innovation report, they specifically wrote, we need our reporters to become social media stars. We need to inculcate in them best practices for going viral. There's this really funny line in the report where the authors of the report are shocked to find out about a reporter who had not tweeted out his story for two days after publication, okay? 
they wanted a situation where their reporters were out there with a quarter of a million followers, a half a million followers, and when you have that many followers, you become unignorable. And what their own reporters did with that power was force their bosses to make personnel decisions, to fire, um, to fire James Bennett, to fire Donald McNeil, the star COVID reporter, right? They, but this was, what I'm trying to say is this was by design. This wasn't an accident. They saw that that was where digital media was going. Like, so the way that it works is, so, so for much of American history, uh, most journalism was local journalism. So you had like a town, it was before the great sorting. So you'd have a town in America that was like maybe 60% Republicans and 40% Democrats or the opposite or 50-50. And a publisher had a choice. He could let his journalists follow their natural lefty inclinations and report the news in a lefty way and only have lefties on the you know, op-ed page and get you know 40% of the town's readership. Or he could report the news straight, force them to report the news straight, have a totally inoffensive, balanced opinion page, right? And get 100% of the townsfolk reading his paper. And surprise, surprise, that's what they chose. But today, the way we measure success in journalism is through something that's called engagement, okay? How many people engaged with this article? How many people retweeted it? How many people sent it to their aunt? How many people commented on Facebook? And we all know, like the most obvious thing, that the most engaged people online are what? Like the most extreme. So you have a place like the New York Times, the most august, supposed to be, the paper of record, now catering to its most extreme wing by design, which is how you end up with a situation where the New York Times has 91% of its readership are Democrats. That was very hard to achieve for the paper of record, okay? It's also, we can't underestimate the degree to which um, Trump drove a big part of this, which is to say both the New York Times and the ACLU um, were alarmed internally and sensed alarm in many of their readers when Donald Trump was elected. And they said, we're going to be, in the case of the New York Times, the fourth estate bulwark against the scary things that could be coming. And this is coming at a time when the whole news industry is shifting from an advertising model to a subscriber model as, as ad revenue dries up. And the New York Times was very successful at this as a business proposition of, and you know, you see the Washington Post to it, what's their tagline? Democracy dies in darkness. And so they're selling this idea of subscribe to us and we will report and we will stop um, you know, these abusive people from doing bad things. Um, and you know, I kind of want this happening all the time whenever a new president is elected. I really want all the newspapers to be like, okay, we're going to stop all the bad things from happening. And so I'm not entirely complaining. I think that they did a lot of good reporting about bad things that the Trump administration did. I also think they put themselves in the position of um, being the quote unquote resistance. And this massive amount of new subscribers that the Times got, this massive amount of new donors that the ACLU got, um, they kind of had to satisfy those people on some level or they were going to lose them all. And that meant that it was a lot harder to stand up for free speech values if those free speech values seemed like they were going to be complicit in helping a bad thing happen and helping Donald Trump send the troops out into the streets and maybe abuse people. Like th these were the flashpoints, not accidentally, but for a reason, because um, the selling proposition that they made to the public was democracy is in danger, therefore you should um, you know, give your money to us so we can help fight the danger. And that positions you in a certain place demographically that isn't always friendly to um, no, no matter what is going on, we need to let people speak their voice, even if it might have downside consequences. Before I forget, I'm probably going to be spanked because I forgot to say at the very beginning that you have cards on which you should write any questions you might have down, and a nice lady called Melissa will be walking around and collecting them from you. Uh, she's going to watch you and see if you're writing anything and will come to you and pick up your card. Uh, but you said something, you know, so they're taking, they're, they're promising people protection from uh, kind of fascism or whatever it may be um, in exchange for, you know, they're giving, they're giving them partisan value for money, as it were. Uh, I mean, so, so have, have newspapers in effect turned readers into partisans, but also into customers, paying customers who 
who demand satisfaction. Is buying the Times the same thing as buying a pair of pants at Saks Fifth Avenue? I mean, I mean I'm trying to work out, is, is the, you know, have we seen a kind of unholy marriage here between partisanship and, 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 and commercialization? Uh, you know, the, the way that you Bach is saying about engagement. I mean, engagement is this unholy matrimony, right? Because engagement is both the most politically outraged people and also the people who are most likely to pay for your newspaper. Right, but I would say that more important even than the partisanship, like, look, in the in the sort of golden age of American journalism, right? It was like, the, let's say, let's say the 1920s New York, okay? You had so many communist papers that a person could be a communist and have four communist newspapers that he would never dream of opening because they were the wrong kind of communists, okay? The press was really partisan back then, but it was partisan on behalf of the masses. And I think that's the difference here is like we have a right wing media that's partisan on behalf of the top 5%, you know, the petty bourgeoisie of the right. And then we have a left wing media that's totally in the pocket of the like, you know, professional ma managerial class, that top 10% of like professional, you know, liberal coastal elites, right? And no one's speaking to 90% of the rest of Americans. So I would say, yeah, the New York Times has become a luxury good, not because it costs so much, but because it is a signal of a class belonging, you know? Like the way people walk with like little New Yorkers sticking out of their bag. They do that because they want to signal to everybody else. It's the same reason they use the word Latinx, right? Even though only two to 3% of Hispanics use the word Latinx. Why do they say Latinx? So, okay, so my dad's British. And in England, people have accents. And the accent can tell you within 20 miles of where somebody was born, and you can make an, a reasonable, educated guess about how much money their dad made, OK? We don't have accents. We have Latinx, right? It's to tell people, I went to a fancy school, right? Like, that, that, that's essentially what it's become. It's like a class marker, a marker of class belonging. Sure that, that journalism doesn't represent 90%, that, that left-wing and right-wing journalism doesn't represent 90% of Americans. I mean, even your point earlier about all the people who weren't asked if we were going to send money to the Ukraine. I mean, I, I just think you know they voted for people, and those people decide to send money there. So I don't, I don't think the analogy is quite right there. But I guess the other question is, I, I do think that those people have lost a voice, not because of the right-left thing. I mean, they've lost, they've lost representation because of the drying up of local media, um, not necessarily the drying up of lots of communist papers. Um, so, I mean, you know, the fact, like, I, I came from a, you know, Worcester, Massachusetts. There used to be a uh, morning paper, an evening paper. Now, I mean, the, the paper is, like, five pages long. It's, there's nothing in it except, you know, stuff that they've taken from the New York Times, frankly. And, and I do think that that's a problem. Um, but also, the working class has also gotten out of the habit of reading. I mean, so there's kind of a, a lot going on here that you can blame on our education system, too. I mean, I, try, you know, try going to a working class person and telling them you should sit down and read this newspaper, even if it's something that technically might interest them, even if it's the New York Post and it's covering you know, all the issues that are supposedly of interest to the working class. I don't think you're going to get that kind of engagement. Well, I'll just, I'll just quickly, I just have to quote Christopher Lash here again, because he, he, he makes this really important point, which is people put in the work to learn things when they're part of the conversation. He's like, information doesn't drive debate. Debate drives information. If you're in a debate with somebody, you're going to go out there and find the points that are going to prove them wrong. And, and the, to me, the, the, the fact that there's a mass consumer boycott underway of the news is proof of how irrelevant it is to their lives, not proof of like uh, some failing amongst them. Like There's nothing there for them, so why would they read it? But in your book, I mean, you cite the popularity of Fox News, but even Fox News is only getting like 3 million viewers. I mean, it's, not, it's, it's still not, even though Fox News is, according to you in a lot of ways, talking to a lot of those working class people and giving them the information they need to have debates with people about Trump or anything else, it's still not engaging. A lot of people have just tuned out, and I don't think we can just blame that all on the, you know, the, 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 the media not representing the working class. I think there have been two points in my life where there have been kind of media revolutions. One around the blogosphere um, and two around kind of social media slash now the rise of podcasts. And I think it's interesting that some of the biggest winners in both of those revolutions were people who were more conversational in nature than the kind of established institutions. And so Joe Rogan is the famous example right now. It's kind of remarkable that the guy's talking for three and a half, four hours at a time, right? And has a massive fan base, bigger than most cable news shows, bigger than all cable news shows, 
of people who are listening along to these conversations. Um, I think that the conversational mode, it's a bit more willing to say things that people, you know, that are off the top of the head that aren't necessarily, um, you know, well researched beforehand, not fact checked. Um, but there is a kind of um, benefit that you get from listening to two people engage at length on a subject and hear the playfulness and hear the back and forth. And, you know, it's, um, you can find some of this in like, Socratic dialogues as opposed to monologic teaching, you know, like a kind of back and forth give and take. Um, I think that the press by kind of constraining and being afraid of these kinds of conversations, afraid of like, oh, someone is going to say the wrong thing, going to use the wrong pronoun for someone, going to kind of step on themselves and offend someone, is kind of losing out on the ability to capture this whole audience that wants to engage conversationally, um, but can't because there are too many taboos within certain institutions. And so the market is kind of like, okay, well, we'll do it all these other places. But also there's, there's been a, I mean, the shift from like Hannity and Combs to Hannity, right. I mean, has also <laughs> been, no, no one who's watching this program even wants to hear from Combs anymore. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, I don't know if I would consider Combs a real conversation, but I do take your point. Um, but it's, I, I mean, mean, I don't think CNN really, I mean, does CNN even have like, you know, real conservatives? Sitting no, but, but there was, I think Naomi's point is a good one because at least, there was a time where there was at least play acting at, at kind of one side and the other, even yeah. though it was completely staged and hokey. Whereas now there's, they've dispensed even with that pretense, I think, if that was your point. Uh, there's been, there's been such a kind of outpouring of love and questions that, uh, <laughs> that I, I think I'm going to start throwing them at you earlier than I had planned to, because otherwise we will not get through, I'm not going to get through, be able to get through all, but, um, and I'm struggling with some of the handwriting. Um, but I'll do my best if I, if I, if I misread someone sort of egregiously and you're the person being misinterpreted, please yell and say that's not what I said. Um, so somebody who's nameless asks, and then, you know, anyone who wants to just wade in, please do so. Is there an inherent, inherent conflict between the notion of safetyism and honest journalism? Part two of the question, which may be easier to answer. Are even journalists afraid to speak or write truthfully, or are they self-censoring? Are journalists self-censoring? Yes. No? Oh, yes. I mean, absolutely. And what's, what's <laughs> making them self-censor? I know we've touched some of it, but let's just spell it out. Why? I mean, I'll give you just an example. So I freelance for a lot of publications. I freelance for the Washington Post and the New York Times, the New York Post. And, and, and every pitch I write is specifically crafted toward a particular editor who has a particular set of biases that I'm aware of before I even start the email. So I mean, I think, and, and so even on um, for people who are sort of slightly outside of what they would normally publish, they're still getting the only things that they're willing to publish are from people who are willing to at least, you know, um, kind of at least tip themselves a little bit in that direction. Um, and I think so. It, as a freelancer, certainly you have to constantly be, you know, censoring or at least directing your articles in particular places. And if you're working for one of the publications, I mean, all the stuff we've been talking about with the New York Times, I think, is just the tip of the iceberg. I think that social media has radically changed the incentive structure for journalists. Um, and, and Slack has to some extent too, where um, one thing that social media allows is the coordination of a small number of people to do something. So it isn't necessarily that like everyone is so angry at this article that you've written, but like all the people that are angry can get together and make a lot of noise and have a coordinated attempt to get you fired, to make your life miserable. Um, and then internally, Slack makes it, it, it has a horizontal leveling effect uh, on managers' ability to dictate a workplace culture, especially when combined with a pandemic where everyone is working from home now, and you can have kind of all this communication. And so I think a lot of journalists self-censor just out of uh, self-preservation, and you have to be in a very special place to not feel like you have to do that. Kate, Kate Wright, who's named herself, asks, 
trigger words. Please list the top 10 trigger words. Um, but maybe we don't have to list, list 10 each, but off the top of your head, can you think of some, maybe Bhatia? What do you mean by trigger words? Like words you would have to put a trigger warning on? Or I guess words that might sort of trigger. <laughs> word, word, words that cause people to go, ooh, careful. Like actual words themselves? Yeah. Well, I mean, what are the, well, let's, let me broaden that, let me read. What are, what are some of the concepts that, that are part of day-to-day -day journalism that cause people to sort of tiptoe or feel they're walking on eggshells? Uh, equating racial bias with racial disproportionality. I mean, it's, may, I mean, it's one that I have to do all the time, explaining the difference between just because things affect different populations differently doesn't mean it's systemic racism at work. I think anything involving identities of any sort are pr pretty high up on the list, and and then anything that is coded or actually is kind of far right or fascism, and and then increasingly on the other side, um, you know, anything that is getting labeled as um, being a groomer or you know talking about um, sex education to third you know, people in third grades, the online hordes will say these teachers are grooming people and kind of willfully conflate uh, the teaching that they don't like with, you know, something as awful as pedophilia. And so um, those are the main triggers that come to mind for me right now, of like current Twitter discourse. Maybe this question is addressed to Bart here, was at least sparked by Bart. You say the working class, at least the white one, uh, was deplatformed? Uh, were they ever platformed in the first place? Um, I'm not speaking only about the white working class. I think the black working class has been treated even worse um, because the people who are supposed to be on their side and their defenders are sentencing them to live in a way that they would never dream of allowing their own children to live. And I find that to be disgusting. And <laughs> they get mad at me a lot. The people that were critiquing, but I'm so much angrier at them, and I, <laughs> you can't get them to talk about any of the things that 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 working class communities of color actually need, in a way that would actually help them. They speak about them in a way that that helps the elites. It's just absolutely disgusting. So I am very much talking about the multiracial working class. They, the the white working class did used to have a much bigger platform because the Democrats used to see themselves as on the side of labor. And so they had a whole party um, mechanism that was deeply involved and embedded in the kinds of organizations that promoted um, healthy, thriving working class life. And um, like I said, there was a period in American journalism that started around the Gilded, a Gilded Age that existed for the sole purpose of dragging the rich through the mud and representing the working class and giving them a voice. And that was true like really up until you know the 50s. It was never true of the New York Times. So yeah, they were always deplatformed when it came to the New York Times. But you know, most of American journalism very much had a middle class and a working class audience in mind for a lot of American journalism's history. Did that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Here's a question that I'm, I'm puzzling to, 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 um, to read, but uh, the story that's been told is been first localism, then 60-40 Democrat, Republican, or vice versa engagement, morphing into extreme partisanship. Uh, it goes on to say, how come there aren't major institutions like the New York Times or the Washington Post that have been captured by the right? Um, why, why, is, why have the big media houses not been captured by the right, I guess, is the underlying question. No, it's a great question. I mean, it's, it's um, I, I think that um, what, we've, what we're seeing now, which is that, um, you know, the, a certain kind of liberal intelligentsia writ large, right, like the chattering classes, academia, the political classes, you know, that sort of the elite capture of all of these institutions, um, you know, that is a very interesting thing, how it used to be the left represented the working class and the right represented the rich. And now you sort of have a little bit of a crossing of that where you look at like what the Democrats stand for today and it's all of these things that penalize the working class and very much benefit liberal elites. So how did it happen that these institutions became peopled by people from that class rather than from the other class? I think it has to do with the, the way that um, our economy has started to 
work really, really well for people in the knowledge industry and really, really poorly for anybody who works with their hands, who makes things for a living, who moves things for a living, does any of the things we actually need to survive. And, and, and so that sort of, the, you, you, you know, you always had journalists sort of leaning left, but they didn't always go to college. In fact, most of them didn't go to college. They started to go to college when people who were sort of from that liberal point of view started to go to college, when people who went to college started to make more money. And even you know, richer kids started to demand more money when they came out of college and took these jobs. So I think it is very much bound up with the way that a certain kind of liberal orientation is, is associated with a college degree and how that sort of came to capture a lot of the industries that we think of as producing information and knowledge. Anybody else want to weigh in? I, I mean, I just think it, there's, a, there's obviously a pipeline from our elite universities into our elite media at this point. Um, I mean, you could, there are lots of background reasons for that. But once that starts happening, it's just self reinforcing. And it's like the universities, which have just become more and more tilted in a particular direction. Once the people inside are just hiring with those sensibilities in mind, you just get more and more of that. And I think it becomes very hard to undo. I think I have a slightly different take, which is that. Excellent. Um, it, it, at some point, it stopped being worth or very many right-leaning people fighting to get control, to take control of a legacy media institution when you could just create your own and make lots of money doing it. So if you're, um, you know, if you can create the Daily Wire and become a multimillionaire after you worked at Breitbart, um, why would you go try to compete for some highly competitive job at the New York Times? Um, there are institutions that have tons of readers on the right who who dominate, you know, what is shared on Facebook. They don't have the prestige of um, the that the New York Times or the Washington Post have in certain circles. Uh, but if you're outside of the circles that care about that prestige, then you're go not going to be inclined to go and like fight your way when there's better money elsewhere. So I think that's part of the story as well. What, related to that, and we'll, I'm reinterpreting a question here. Why, why would Elon Musk want to buy Twitter? <laughs> or why on earth would Elon Musk want to buy Twitter? I mean, I have a <laughs> kind of conspiratorial answer to that. But I mean, he knew that 130,000 Teslas were going to get recalled because they were, burnt, you know, simultaneously, you know, what's it called, um, combusting. I mean, he wanted, he needed to make a home for himself on the right when he realized that things were going to go bad for him. And I think he, he played the right. This guy who's like knee deep in China, you know, who built a, a, a showroom in Xinjiang in the shadow of concentration camps full of Uyghur Muslims, you know, he, he knew, he, he understood, I have to make a home for myself on the right. And he played the right because he knew that the place where they were most vulnerable is Twitter, where they actually are getting censored in a really gross way. I think it was genius, but very, very evil. <laughs> and, and, and I, I won't pretend to, to know what's in Elon Musk's mind, um, but, but let's, Let's put it this way. Why would a billionaire who uh, does care about free speech, I won't judge if Elon <laughs> himself does or not, um, want to buy Twitter? I mean, it really is a kind of public square. And um, I find it conceivable to believe that improving it by 15% or having it get 15% worse could have meaningfully, meaningful effects on the future. Um, and, and the question of, how to do content moderation on Twitter, I think, is very tricky. There are some people who would say it ought to be the First Amendment standard if you can say it. Um, you know, If the government couldn't censor it under a First Amendment standard, then you should be able to say it on Twitter. Um, I think there are very strong arguments against that, that, that um, if what you're trying to do is create a good, meaningful conversation, um, there are other lines around, say, certain kinds of harassment that would be OK by First Amendment standards, probably, but that you would probably want to stop if you want a large number of people to come and have out good conversations all of the time. And so um, maybe, uh, maybe a rich guy with a kind of engineering mindset thinks he could improve that. I don't know. Uh, I hope he can, but I'm not optimistic. Yeah, maybe. Okay, that's <laughs> um, very wise.
like hard for me to put myself in Elon Musk's place. Um, here's a question which um, asks, with tone deaf reporting from CNN and others calling the 2020 riots, quote unquote, mostly peaceful, while standing in front of a burning building, I assume these are the riots that happened in the wake of, uh, is independent journalism going to become more trusted in the coming years? Is it possible for independent journalism to become more trusted, given what the letter, the question writer Susan Patena says, was this tone deaf reporting? Well, I think reporting that um, asks you not to believe what's in front of your eyes, I think, is, is a problem. Um, and <laughs> sorry, um, that's obvious. Um, and and I and so I think people will gravitate toward news sor sources that are confirming what they think or what they see, and that that could be a problem too. I mean, if you're just going for a news source that confirms what you already believe, but but I do think that we should at least start with the idea that people are going to gravitate toward a news service that um, describes what is in front of them, and not just what is in front of the reporter, but obviously what is in front of the reader. Um, and so, you know, this is a conversation that I think we've had about reporting on inflation recently. Like, you know, people are describing how much their milk is costing, how much their gasoline is costing, and they feel like they're being, you know, to borrow a phrase, gaslit by, you know, by the by some of the reporting that it's not real, it's just going to pass soon. Or, I mean, and this is coming obviously, you know, from the administration as well. But, but I think people start to get very angry when they're told by their news sources that what you're experiencing is not real. Because they have other sources of information against which they can match what yes. they're receiving from yes. the Yes, it, it becomes much harder, I think, when there are issues like, you know, Ukraine or something, which is so far away from them that they don't have any evidence on their own to compare it to. Um, but, but in terms of, like, the issues that people are experiencing every day, they have to turn to news sources that are going to help them understand that. Um, here's a fun question um, from David Amundsen. Why was Carville and Matalin never a show? We were talking about Hannity and Combs. Why didn't that wonderful husband and wife combo ever have a show? I, I don't think this is about free speech diminishing, but it's probably about why we never had that pleasure. Did, was there a failure of imagination? I'm just not familiar enough with either one. Okay. No? I think they were both on different shows. Different together, shows. But I don't think they ever had their own show. Yeah, I guess it's different networks signed them up different separately, and they would have been in breach of, co breach of contract if they appeared together. Um, sorry, boring answer. Um, I will confess to not being able to read what's left on my three cards. You must forgive me. Um, we've got a few more minutes before we wind up. Um, Last thoughts, is, is the sort of cratering of the um, journalism market, the economics of the media, also contributing in some way to this increasing isolation and elitism? In the, you, you know, who, who can afford to work for the Times at a starting salary of, you know, $32,000 a year and live in Manhattan? Only someone who, who can, who, whose mom and dad can pay for their apartment in Greenwich Village or Carroll Gardens or Park Slope. Um, so are we sort of seeing, so you, are we seeing a sort of reinforcing by kind of market forces and by demographic change of these other trends? I mean, I'm, I'm 42 and I think um, it was right around the oldest um, or, or the youngest you could be to still start out at a local newspaper and have a meaningful career path from there. You said you were 32? Uh, I'm 42. 42. Okay. I, and, um, you know, I, my first job was at the Inland Valley Daily Bulletin, which I went to right after college. And um, as those kind of local newspaper opportunities dry up, more and more hires in the national media are coming from graduate programs um, or sometimes straight from undergraduate programs to internships. It's certainly... Um, has been a radical shift over time of the demographics of the media industry. And it has um, 
created a mindset that is just more in keeping with the, um, you know, with the acculturation of elite universities. I think that that's if, definitely happening. If you were starting out as a journalist today, what would your trajectory be if you didn't have that local base? Talk, talk us through, imagine what Connor's Friedersdorf in 2023 would do. I mean, so I was also kind of at the cusp of the blogging era, and then it was you really could just kind of start writing and try to attract attention. Uh, um, it's a bit more difficult on social media, but I suppose if I wanted to end up at the Atlantic, I would try to um, pick a couple things and develop expertise in them and start tweeting about them a lot and try and engage other people at the Atlantic who are writing about those things. And meanwhile, try to get diplomas from impressive institutions that would get me internships at that kind of place. Um, and you, you can see how this would kind of constrain the kind of politics one would express. I mean, I, I should say, um, you know, I've never fit comfortably into any kind of ideological box, and I've been comfortable at the Atlantic for 10 years now um, writing lots of things. I'm, I feel like one of the few who doesn't have to self-censor. And uh, like, given everything we've said in this panel, I, I would emphasize that I think all of these institutions are still contested spaces where the kind of anti-free speech factions have gotten more powerful over time. Um, but there's still many people who really believe in free speech at them. And I would like to strengthen their hand rather than write them off. Um, but to, to kind of finish answering your question, the dynamics would change in that um, a lot of the positioning that you would have to do um, on social media to attract the attention of the right people and not alienate the wrong people I think would be um, kind of the enemy of being a free thinking person who just followed the story or the arguments where they led. Yeah, but it, I last to say, I, I, when I was, uh, so my first job out of college was as an intern at the Wall Street Journal. And I started asking people, what do I do to get back here full time? And the advice I got was either go work for a local paper for a while uh, or go get a graduate degree in some kind of, you know, exp some area of expertise. Um, or go work at like a, you know, an opinion kind of magazine or something like that. And I, and I have to say that the develop expertise thing is an, is an interesting route and maybe part of the problem we're talking about because um, it doesn't lead necessarily to the kind of reporting that we want from our newspapers. Like we don't, we don't train people much more to have the kind of ability to go into a room full of people that you don't know and don't understand and ask questions that will lead to interesting answers. Instead, you're coming in and you're saying, I have a law degree and I want to cover you know, the Supreme Court, or I have you know, a business degree and I want to cover business for you. And that, um, I think that leads to more of the elitism, but it also leads to a kind of problem with just not having good general reporting. Right, the best journalists find the answers, they don't have them. So, uh, but we, we, we started with you, Bajia, so let me end with you, in your view, are you optimistic about journalism and free speech going forward, or are you pessimistic? And then we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. I'm very optimistic about America, okay. but I am very pessimistic about journalism. I just think journalists have made themselves, by and large, irrelevant to the lives of the American people. And like I said, what it, like I opened with, like, yes, all of this little elite infighting means that the views that you're going to hear in the public sphere are going to be increasingly circumscribed but that is not the big threat to our democracy. The big threat to our democracy is the downward mobility of the working class and the fact that there is no stability in those communities. It's a huge crisis there. People can't afford to you know, support their families anymore. And like, but their views are not changing. They're not in danger of changing their views because journalists now think that to, it's bigotry to say you want to live in a race-blind society or it's bigotry to say there's a difference between men and women. They're not changing their views because of that. The, the fact that their views are not in the public sphere is not a threat to their views or their ability to express them. The thing that is a threat to their views and their ability to express them and a threat to our democracy is the fact that they have no economic stability, the fact that they are downwardly mobile and they are in trouble, you know, and they are our neighbors. So I, I think for that reason, like, I feel like the, the real problem is slightly elsewhere. And I, that, that's what I would, I guess I would leave you with. <laughs> Well, th thank you. For, that was that was a, a kind of rollicking panel. I hope you 
agree. And, and, and actually more varied in content and opinion than I had expected when we started. So thank you, Bhatia, Naomi, and Connor for that hour of fun. <laughs>